So my talk is on limitations and risks of machine ethics, and by that I mean reasons why it's difficult to ensure that machines behave in a reliably ethical fashion. The term machine ethics has traditionally been used to refer to uh, near-term AI systems as opposed to AGI, so I'm using the term in a more broad sense that also includes things that have been called friendly AI. Uh, and th the basic point of my talk is that due to the nature of ethics and the difficulty of acting in a rational fashion in a complex environment such as ours, it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, to ensure that any, in, in any intelligent agent, no matter how uh, much resources it has available within a practical sense, uh, to ensure that it will behave ethically. So there are a couple of possible motivations for thinking about machine ethics, uh, defined here as developing computational models of morality. You could do it to learn more about ethics for human purposes, you could build moral advisors, or you could build artificial moral agents that directly act in the world based on their ethical uh, beliefs. In the context of AGI risk, you can think of machine ethics as a subset of motivation selection, uh, selection in the taxonomy that Bostrom talked about, as well as a form of internal constraint uh, in, so in Sotola et al.'s uh, taxonomy of AI risk approaches. So I'm going to talk about the nature of ethics and why it's problematic to assume that we could ensure that a machine would be able to behave reliably ethically. And the general point is that if we are unable to come up with a system, systematization of human ethics, then we shouldn't be confident that we can do so for machines. There are various problems that have been identified with uh, unified theories of morality uh, in the context of AI as well as more generally. Uh, Yudkowsky and Melhauser and Helm have noted that human values are complex and fragile, and this was also commented on uh, by Bostrom a few days ago. There are also issues related to computational intractability of perfect ethical behavior. There are conflicts between principles and duties that may arise in the course of everyday life and real moral situations, as well as the problem of ranking different choices that are available to an agent. So obviously I can't give a comprehensive assessment of all possible ethical theories, but just to focus on two classes of ethical theories in particular and some general uh, objections that have been raised against them, if you think of consequentialism as an ends-oriented class of moral systems and deontology as means-oriented systems, uh, both of them have difficulty for accounting for all possible situations. So there are unacceptable conclusions that can derive uh, from a purely consequentialist framework, such as you know, the need to torture someone in order in order to save a greater number of lives. On the other hand, there could be uh, opposite situations in which de a deontological conception of morality uh, would be implausible, such as, for example, saying that it's uh, immoral to kill one person when you could save billions or even trillions. So the difficulty of uh, reconciling these different theories of morality is one problem, but there are also unresolved problems in morality in general, regardless of which theory you choose. And this is going to be a problem for an AGI that's acting in the world at a large scale, because the more of the world you try and act upon, the more you're going to run into these sorts of unsolved moral problems that deal with large scale issues. For example, two in particular are population ethics, which has to do with how we should ascribe value to uh, states of the world and people on the basis of the number of them. So for example, you might intuitively uh, think that it matters that there are more people rather than fewer, all things being equal, so you have some sort of uh, formula for multiplying you know, the quantity times the quality of these people's lives. However, there can be counterintuitive uh, conclusions that you draw from that, such as that it would be better to have trillions of people living barely acceptable lives and then to kill everyone on Earth today. What sort of entities have moral value also could be a difficult problem for an AGI that is trying to think far into the future, uh, because not only will it have to think about you know, humans as well as non uh, human animals and their moral status, but also the possible the, the space of possible AGIs in the future and the moral status that they could have. So it's not just a problem that human values are complex and fragile in the sense that Yukowski and others have talked about, but it's also the case that they could be internally inconsistent and incoherent. For example, Savulescu uh, here at Oxford has argued that there are certain aspects of our folk morality that have evolved and were adaptive in earlier times, but that are no longer adaptive in modern society. For example, uh, a high discount rate applied towards the future and our tendency to care more about those closest to us. Uh, there's no a priori reason to assume that our evolved intuitions, insofar as you uh, take a naturalistic understanding of morality, will necessarily be consistent. And this is a problem for approaches that try and systematize human intuitions through some sort of algorithm. 
Uh, two lines of evidence that can be thought of in terms of the psychological literature on morality that are relevant here. First uh, is Haidt's analysis of the cognitive processes at work in morality. He argues that there are many. He argues that there are many lines of evidence to suggest that the role of, of rationality in uh, morality has been overstated, and we think that we're more uh, rational in terms of thinking about ethical situations than we actually are. There are examples such as moral dumbfounding, which is the idea that we're unable to articulate a reason for our beliefs, often which have evolutionary explanations, but we're unwilling to uh, to give them up, even if we're pressed upon the reasons for them. Another line of evidence uh, through thought, through analyzing the brains of people who are responding to thought experiments, such as the trolley problem, in which you are given the option of, of hitting a switch that leads to killing one person rather than five, or the footbridge, footbridge situation in which you push a man over a bridge and then he stops the train uh, with his body directly. Often people will give conflicting answers to these sorts of situations. Green's analysis of this uh, of, of this dichotomy between people's resistance to pushing the man over the bridge and hitting the switch is that we have an evolved uh, opposition to physical contact and the use of physical force. We have no such intuitions about, about hitting switches, even if the moral consequence is the same. He uses a camera analogy to say that we have automatic and manual modes to our morality and that these aren't necessarily reconcilable. Uh, I would note, though, that this is you know, a controversial view within moral psychology and as is the general project of naturalizing morality. So even if you have a particular moral system that seems to solve all problems, it's going to be very difficult to implement it in the world. And these are problems that will apply to any bounded agent that has finite resources uh, of both computation as well as finite knowledge. If you think about the classical frame problem in AI and then you apply it to moral situations, you see that there could be an infinite range of possible factors that are relevant in a particular situation in terms of their long-term consequences. This is particularly problematic for theories such as consequentialism, which are concerned with the ethical implications of your uh, actions over the long term. There could also be domain-specific knowledge and experience that's necessary uh, in order to act ethically. The computational complexity of morality is also important here. So Gigerenzer argues that we do something called moral satisficing, which is that we have to uh, greatly reduce the space of options that we consider and the uh, amount of analysis that we do towards those options with regards to their moral implications. This seems to be necessary both for a consequentialist and a deontological perspective on morality. Uh, and, you know, for example, this analysis by Reynolds concludes that uh, for consequentialist and deontological ethical approaches, they're both computationally hard, uh, scaling uh, as a function of mn to the l, where m is the number of <coughs> actions available, n is the number of agents, and l is the time horizon. There are also environment-based limitations. So let's say you have a lot of computational resources, you have an ethical theory, you're still going to have difficulty acting in the world in a reliably ethical way. There are all sorts of nonlinear interactions in the environment, as other speakers have noted, uh, which makes it difficult to model the environment in a consistent way. There can be chaotic effects as well as black swan events that throw out the entire model that you are relying upon. In addition, there are intrinsic philosophical reasons why you can never have full access to the environment and to verify, validate, and confirm models of the natural and social environment. In addition to all these issues I brought up, there are also problems that arise as a result of learning and evolutionary processes of autonomous agents. So as Mueller has noted, uh, the, the autonomous interaction with the environment that's critical for an agent to become intelligent will require less control in order to allow that scaling up to occur. However, learning about ethics in this sort of, uh, in this sort of fashion could pose risk for a, very power, for a very powerful agent, and it's impossible to expose it to all possible situations. So you might ask, how do humans act ethically? Well, first of all, we have a lot of advantages, such as more computational power than existing affordable computers, as well as lots of experience, both in terms of our lives, and as well as uh, if you think of our evolutionary uh, psychology as embodying some uh, moral experience. But on the other hand, it's unclear that we do act in a reliably ethical fashion. Most people don't act in ways that are consistent across a wide range of situations, and everyone makes mistakes. And I personally wouldn't trust any particular individual to make decisions for all of humanity. There are specific classes of machine ethics proposals, and again, I'm using that term in a broad sense to include uh, theories of AI, AGI friendliness, 
And here are four categories that you can think about. And I can't deal with every single one of them, but just some broad limitations of these classes of approaches can help us think about ways in which an AGI ethics system could fail. If you take a top-down approach to morality, which is to say that you have an ethical theory and then you implement it in some sort of system and have the system reason based on those high-level principles about particular cases, then you're going to run into computational limitations as well as the limitations of unified moral theories that I talked about earlier. In addition, as Yampolsky argued yesterday, an overly literal interpretation of the utility function could pose its own issues. If you take a bottom-up bottom approach uh, to uh, machine ethics, which is to say reasoning based on particular cases and building up a theory of morality based on experience, then you're going to have the safety issues that I mentioned earlier, but there are also some other issues that will arise, such as not guaranteeing that any particular principle will be followed. There will be no guarantee that the system will eventually arrive at a fully coherent or consistent theory of morality, and it might be difficult for it to explain the reasons for its actions. So I think that a lot of humans might have difficulty accepting, for example, a system that says that it killed person Y because at time step 789, node 1 had a value of 0.81. Psychological approaches to machine ethics take the human cognitive system as a model and then try and instantiate it, it in an AGI. The problem with this is that, first of all, there's intra and interpersonal variation in morality, so it's difficult to say whose moral system you're going to be modeling and whether it will be consistent in the first place. There's also the inherent problem of the naturalistic fallacy, so it's, it's problematic to say that because humans reason in this way about morality that it's necessarily correct and that we should lock that in into the future in these powerful <coughs> systems. In addition, it doesn't seem to be possible to resolve outstanding philosophical issues and limitations of folk morality in this way. Various approaches have been put forward at this conference as well as at others uh, to deal with ethics in the context of a particular AGI architecture or in terms of some sort of way of learning about values and extrapolating them in the future. There are going to be various limitations of these approaches. While they may be valuable, uh, some things to consider are, for example, the reconciliation of conflicting values both within and between humans, the risks due to acquiring vast amounts of resources in the course of deciding what is ethical in the first place, so there's kind of a, kind of a chicken and the egg problem there, as well as the loss of important elements of our fragile values in the process of trying to extrapolate them in a consistent way. There could be high sensitivity to initial conditions, for example, the mood of someone prior to their values being extrapolated, the prior, their prior exposure to schools of thought, many of which could be consistent with their prior beliefs, and as well as what I would call the iRobot problem, which is that we don't know for sure what the logical implications of our beliefs and the particular moral systems which we instantiate in a given machine are. So in the movie iRobot, as well as uh, not the novel Runaround and others by Isaac Asimov, what happens is that the robots decide that the logical implication of the three laws of robotics is that they need to take control over humanity's destiny and prevent humans from killing each other. While I don't suggest that that in particular is going to happen, the overarching issue is that we need to think clearly about ways in which our values could be taken to their logical extreme and whether or not we are sure that we actually believe what we think we believe. This is a summary of some of the possible failure modes of machine ethics, which I've already identified, so I'm not going to read them again there. And the last section I want to talk about is the insufficiency of machine ethics. I think it should be fairly obvious why there are going to be human factors involved in any sort of AGI safety regime. And as Hibbert argued earlier in the conference, it's, it's perhaps more of a threat how humans are going to be using these systems than any a uh, threat that emerges from the system itself. However, these are going to you know, be tightly correlated. Some examples of issues are the reprogram reprogramming of AGIs, which could be possible if they're widely distributed, as well as whether they're centralized, unless you have a very, uh, very wide system of surveillance and essentially a totalitarian state. There could be domains uh, that are ethically complex and problematic that an agent is put into by a human operator in an irresponsible fashion. There could be a training environment which is deceptive for the agent, and again, uh, dealing with the frame problem will be difficult because there could be aspects of the training environment which are hidden from the AGI that lead it to uh, come to erroneous conclusions. There are also issues related to hacking uh, that, that tie into what uh, Jan Polsky was saying yesterday. So typically there's been a tripartite distinction in terms of what's required for trust of a human. Some of these factors are benevolence, competence, and integrity. 
And I would argue that when you think of an AGI, the, the analogy between uh, integrity and cybersecurity is pretty strong in the sense that if you want to be able to trust an AGI to be benevolent over time, you want to ensure that the cybersecurity infrastructure of the whole planet is secure. That means that even if we have a wide system of AGIs that are acting in a reliably ethical fashion, a new evil one might come along and hack all of them, and then you're going to end up worse than if you had never had them in the first place. There could also be system level issues arising from multiple AGIs, even if they each act in an ethical fashion in their own domain. Examples of problematic interactions between agents that aren't trying to be uh, malevolent are machine trading, in which there can be vast fluctuations and destruction of wealth as a result of, act of agents acting in a fashion that uh, leads to some sort of systemic effects. There could be homogeneity of agents resulting from the use of uh, the same architecture or ethical system across a wide range of domains that leads to, a, it leads to a, a decrease in the overall quality of decision making. There could be declining human wages, uh, such as as Hansen and Brings you already talked about in terms of the implications of AI, as well as uh, issues that we don't foresee now, but they could arise from a poor, uh, a poor matchup between co cooperation and competition. So generally, we would think that an ethical AI would always be a good thing. However, there are many aspects of modern society that depend on competition and self-interested behavior. We don't know, for example, what the economic implications of everyone trying actively to maximize a global utility function for others would be. There could be all sorts of unintended consequences of this. And lastly, building an AGI infrastructure that is in charge of many of the technological systems we depend on could lead to vulnerabilities to catastrophic technological failure. So why does this matter for AGI risk? I would say that there are a couple of reasons. One is that if you expect or hope for AGIs to act on a large scale, then you should be more concerned about the limitations of machine ethics, both in terms of the unresolved moral issues that could lead to problematic behavior, for example, uh, as relates to population ethics, as well as the fact that if you're pessimistic about alternative AI risk, uh, AI risk approaches such as boxing, then you should be concerned about the fact that there are problems with machine ethics approaches as well. If you think that a single AGI is going to be far more powerful than others, then you should be very concerned about the prospect of centralizing moral decision making. And lastly, I would say that you could think of a hierarchy of safe uses for machine ethics in the sense that generally using it to inform human ethics is safer than using it as an advisor, which is safer than limited action, which is safer than large scale action. So in conclusion, machine ethics might be useful in some domains, but it's by no means a solid technological fix. Uh, for the problem of AI safety. These three criteria that Sarowitz and Nelson have identified for what a technological fix, uh, what criteria a technological fix uh, should meet in order to actually qualify as fixing the problem is embodying the cause-effect uh, cause effect relationship, which clearly machine ethics doesn't do, given the role of humans in operating and developing and deploying the systems. The effect of the technological fix must be accessible using relatively unambiguous or uncontroversial criteria, which clearly ethics is not, and it must contribute to a standardized technical core, which we did not yet have in EGI. So my contention is that by thinking about the ambiguities in ethics and the difficulty of rational action in the world, we can identify some failure modes and come up with better systems for machine ethics. I don't have a solution for you, but I think that thinking systematically about these limitations could be helpful. And lastly, I would say that machine and AGI ethics might not be the best framework. As uh, Hibbert mentioned earlier, it's really important to think about how people are using these systems, and a better framework might be to think in terms of ethical human machine systems. So with that, I will open up for questions. Hello there. Uh, there seems to be a fair amount of anthropocentrism or anthropomorphism in thinking that um, the correct or most useful kind of AGI system would be a full autonomous uh, system. Uh, instead, you refer to ethical human machine systems. Could you try to expand a little bit on that? So, in part, I'm responding to the literature on machine ethics, which is largely based on human ethics and trying to develop models of human ethics. So I think it's anthropocentric in that sense that uh, people have argued both implicitly and explicitly that we should model these systems on, say, human values. But I'm, I'm not sure if 
I'm not sure what you mean about the human machine system part of your question, so. Yes, um, I mean, well, we seem to, uh, um, most people seem to assume that some kind of full autonomous intelligent agent should be treated on the basis of, well, thinking of it like a human person. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, uh, what would you recommend for thinking of a correct theory of ethics that involve combination of humans and machines, either as tools or uh, otherwise extensions of humans? Um, I don't have a good answer for that, and I think it really depends on the level of autonomy of the system in question. So I think today, most systems are not autonomous, and you can see technology is largely an extension of humans. So this, so a human-machine framing might make sense today. Over time, as systems become more autonomous, then it might make sense to think of them as discrete systems. But I think, you know, it, it'll really depend on the system, the situation in question, and I'm not sure that that I or anyone has really well fleshed out theory of human machine ethics, so I don't know what to tell you there. If I may quickly insert a question sure. of my own. As somebody who's neither an ethicist or a computer scientist, um, one concern that I didn't see up there in your very comprehensive talk was the way that our ethics and morals have been evolving. If we, for example, programmed an AGI with um, the morals of um, you know, zero AD Rome, we'd have all sorts of problems. And it seems like we may have the same problems if, even if we have a comprehensive system that works now, it may not work in 2,000 years or 1,000 years when our understanding of the AGI's understanding of the galaxy and the universe has changed drastically. Now, you could allow a level of evolvability in morals, but that would seem to imply a risk associated. Um, would you have any comments on that? I think that's a difficult issue and it, and you know, the whole idea of extrapolating value seems problematic. <coughs> I'm not sure that there's a, a good answer in the sense of how much we would want a system or even ourselves to extrapolate our values in terms of logical implications. So with the iRobot example, it's not obvious to me that, uh, you know, the system Vicky was actually mistaken in its utilitarian belief that it should take over humans in order to protect them. However, the question is, do we actually uh, want our, our views to be taken to their logical extreme, and what sort of standard should we apply to the evolution of morality? And a lot of the machine ethics approaches have been based on taking humans as a model and trying to come up with good models of what we currently believe. But as you say, that has changed over time. And you know, it, it really depends on whether, for example, you take a realist or an anti-realist perspective on morality, whether you think there's a truth of the matter, or if you think it's sort of a human institution and theoretical construct. And you know, I, besides saying that it's a difficult issue, and I agree with you that uh, we don't necessarily want to lock in a potentially uh, soon to be outdated ethical system. I, I think I agree. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, both a short remark and sort of a question. The short remark is that you mentioned declining human wages, and I'd like to mention that Kurt Vonnegut in his first uh, science fiction novel, Player Piano, which he wrote in 1952, sort of uh, described contemporary Western society where a lot of people who used to hold good jobs, simple jobs perhaps, but good jobs, are now completely out of a job because of increased robotization. So this is not something for the future. You don't even need AGI for this to happen. This is already happening. Uh, it's just to sort of uh, strengthen your point there. And uh, the other one is sort of a more general notion that maybe the problem statement as you have it is basically an algorithm to which you, you input a situation and then it has to sort of render moral judgment. Uh, uh, I can only operate by analogy to natural language processing, which is where I do most of my AI work. And uh, this is how Chomsky originally posed the problem. You put in a string of symbols and you should decide whether it's grammatical or not. And we have come a long way from that, and uh, every uh, working system is incapable, incapable of doing this. This is not what the systems are doing. They're doing much less in, in, in a relevant sense. Uh, they try to make sense of what's given to them rather than rendering yes, no judgments on them. So uh, maybe a lot of these this, uh, problems that are very real, you mentioned, are, are, a, are a consequence of a, of a too ambitious problem statement. So you take something like, I don't know, uh, 
the ordinary anti-conflict problems. So a large number of them, if you're satisfied with a solution that's, I don't know, 95% uh, good, then you no longer have an anti-conflict problem. You can have a, have a polynomial algorithm to solve it. So maybe a somewhat more relaxed uh, problem sta uh, statement will lead to more effective algorithms. So it, in terms of the, uh, you know, the ambitiousness of the problem statement. If I think, if I understand your question, you're saying that it, that expecting perfection of ethical behavior might be an overly stringent requirement. Is that? It's not saying? just perfection. It's the very idea of being able to render yes no decisions on every case. In fact, when you know, look at human grammar facility, humans are hard put to put to do right. this. There is okay. this gray area of issues. So maybe the. Uh, Give a, give a some kind of uh, upper bound on this or lower yeah. bound on this uh, that may be computationally feasible. Right. Yeah. So I, I agree that uh, expecting a yes/no answer in every case is potentially impossible or un unreasonable to expect, and I think that's something we should think about when we're allowing certain systems to gain a lot of power, whether they might, uh, you know, be find themselves in situations in which there's no good answer for how they should behave. So. I, I, I agree with you that it's an overly stringent statement. Thank you. I uh, think uh, it's rather a comment, not a question, what I have, but in my opinion, it is hard to speak about uh, machine ethics without referring to a specific definition of uh, free will of autonomous systems. Because without the free will uh, at the machine level, you cannot judge uh, the decision and the free will of decision making uh, has been already uh, treated in some papers with, uh, I would say, uh, with very different approaches, very diff different definitions have been uh, proposed by the authors and I wonder if you refer to any one of them or maybe you have proposed uh, your own one. Thank you. That, that's a question. That was right. the first part was the remark. The, the other is the question. Yeah. Thank you. So I haven't thought too much about the free will question, but you know, my, my specific interest uh, in, in this research and in the talk was the question of how to ensure that machines behave as if they are ethical. And in that sense, it's not particularly important to me whether they actually have free will or are actually ethical moral agents in some higher sense in the same way that you know, I, it's not particularly important to me whether someone actually has free will in terms of whether they're treating me ethically. So I've been focusing more on the pragmatic consideration of ensuring uh, safe or benevolent or uh, apparently ethical behavior as opposed to whether or not they actually have free will. So it's, it's an interesting question, but outside what I was thinking about. Yeah. OK. If there are no more questions, then I think we can move on. And I'd like a round of applause again for. Thank you.